Welcome to the MuseCast, where we squeeze every last drop of inspiration out of Sunday's sermon. Yeah, there it goes. Oh my It word. says, okay, there it is. Okay, see, they moved that too. Now, I don't know. Normally, I would look over here and it'll say, hey, you're recording. Well, they moved that. So now it's like up over here and it's, yeah, anyway. Good to see you, Shauna. Good to see you, Dan. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you guys, I swear there is a conspiracy by the one Dan Kent to always start the show with me in some hideous cackling laughter because (laughs) it never fails. We'll just be having a normal conversation and then Dan will say or do or any something and every week, you guys know this, every week we start the show and Shauna is a cackling hyena and so... He's funny, it's... but he's not that funny. So I feel like it's shenanigans is what's happening. <laughs> yeah. A little, little of this, little of that. Yeah. A little of this, a little of that. Where yeah. are those buttons? <laughs> the more I get to know Dan Kent, the more I'm seeing like just the influences of the dearly beloved departed Columbo. I yes. just, just, just very endearing. <laughs> very sweet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, a good that's, influence. That's a good that's influence. That's a great by the way. influence. I love yeah. it. So good. Um, yeah. How are you doing? I haven't seen you in forever. It feels like. Yeah, it's isn't that weird? <laughs> Just like this. Yeah, normally we see each other a lot more than we have lately. So you, well, you've you've you're busy with your family stuff and yeah. college is starting, and so you're yeah. you know dealing with that. I, we've actually had some uh, family death in the family kind of thing. So Barbara has oh. been down in in Milwaukee, and so I've been kind of here, but then doing things that you know Barbara usually does, and so yeah. it's a little hectic here too. But it's all good, and um, Jeez, yeah. I'm sorry and, to hear that, Dan. We'll be praying for you guys. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, it's fall and, uh, yeah, it's, I, what a series we just finished, what a series. I know. you know, we just, <laughs> we finished our, uh, politics series. I know and... I was, um, so I was traveling this weekend, moving my, one of our kiddos back to school. And, um, I, as I was trying to listen, which that never works out well for me. So it, long story short, listening early this morning. And when Greg was like, this is the end of the series, I was like, oh my, you're right. It is the yeah. end. But but he kept referring to Revelation. So I, I know exactly <laughs> where his mind is. But yeah. what a great um, final sermon of the series. And mm-hmm. what a really lovely heart posture that... Mm-hmm. Um, you birthed that Greg took and molded and and crafted and created to bring us a clash of mindsets. And um, I I can't believe the series is over. Like you said, it has been really good. And so I just want to say good job you for uh, what you did. Well, yeah, I, boy, I tell you what, I, I like, I found some kindling and I had like two rocks that I put together, but I really didn't do much more than that. It was really, this series more than a lot of them was, it was sort of a big team effort, you know, uh, everyone contributed and, and it, the, the idea I originally started with and what it became very different, but, uh, it was, it was delicious. It was great. It was, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like I learned a lot and, um, just had a lot of really good reminders and, mm-hmm. uh, and I and I do think you know as we go into this politically tense time in our country, a lot of the lessons from that series I think are going to be really helpful, and I hope I hope that it sticks with me, and I hope it sticks yeah. with uh, the the parishioners and the the congregants as well. So. Oh, same here. You know, as I was traveling, it's so funny because I did have this series on my mind quite a bit because I, you would just see these signs and these billboards and like people are like, I'm like, Oh, you, and and I'm not, this was like for a variety of political candidates. So this is not against any one particular party or candidate, but it's like, Oh, so we really want to decorate our entire home to (laughs) to let the world know who you support. Well, that's a uh, choice. I mean, okay. I guess you don't have strict mm. HOAs there. I don't, it was just <laughs> fascinating, just up and down mm. the highway. Um, and even like I was in another state and it, it's just, wow. So mm. 
I literally kept thinking, okay, heart postures and you never, you know, just trying to like, I have a way to be and respond regardless of what comes at me. And so, yeah, it's, it's been really good. It's been really rich. You use the word delicious. I like that. It's also been a tad convicting a little too much for my liking, but (laughs) that's a bone I'll pick later on (laughs) with our team. But anyway, um, yeah. I'm excited to hear your summary, Dan, because like I said, with traveling and everything, I had to do a quick, quick like intake of a Sunday sermon. So I'm I'm really anxious to hear yeah. your summary and your thoughts and let's we'll see where our discussion goes. Today. Yeah, sounds good. Well, uh, yeah, it, it was I tell you what, out of the sermons, uh, it, I would say that this sermon by Greg it's from an from an information architecture perspective, uh, it, it was pretty brilliant. I mean, how he has it, like like you can see in my notes, see all the boxes and it's just all squared off really well. And that that usually means that, okay, everything had a, the right place for everything. And like a lot of times, you know, notes for a sermon are just like, blah, they're all over the place. And so uh, this is like, man, he had it really orderly. And, um, and so just for whatever that's worth, but, the sermon itself, the actual content of the sermon, uh, he, he really wants to look at uh, pride and how pride has uh, sort of permeated our culture. And and then so then he wants to look at how humility uh, contrasts with that. Um, now, uh, he, 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 well, I'll, I'll come back to that because I have thoughts on that, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. But he starts off the sermon by talking about his early young aspirations to be Superboy, which, uh, uh, you know, I think I, as a young man of 18, I thought I was going to be Batman. So, you know, uh, I, I get it. I get this kind of uh, desire that uh, he had as a young boy. But the lesson that he learns and the lesson that he takes into this is uh, he's not Superboy. And this idea that he could be Superboy and that he was just on the way to being Superboy, well, he sort of crashed into reality that he does not have those superpowers. And he uses this story as a, a foundation for this kind of principle, which says, uh, if you imagine that you can do something that you cannot do, eventually you crash into reality. Uh, if you think that you are more than you are, eventually you will crash into reality. And that is what pride is. It's it's thinking that you're more than you are. And um, and that leads to a fall, Proverbs tells us, and, and it hurts. Um, and, and so he looks at how uh, that lie, that sort of living in a lie of, of who you are, uh, is sort of the foundation for all sin, because all sin is a lie about who we are or what we can do. Um, and, and it's interesting, too, and we, Greg and I have talked about this. I think you and I have talked about this as well. When we sin, whenever we sin, we can only really feasibly do that if we pretend that God is not real, that God is not near, that God is not present, that God isn't who the Bible says God is, we have to sort of pretend like that's not real in order to uh, be able to engage in, in in sin. And so you have to live in that lie, that alternative reality, uh, Greg calls it. Uh, and so then he kind of looks at like this uh, lie and this alternative reality in scripture. And, and this is kind of a cool part of the sermon because he 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 goes kind of cosmic. I mean, he goes big and and uh, kind of metaphysical here. He he starts talking about uh, Satan and the fall of Satan and how that was related to uh, Satan's pride and Satan thinking that he was something that he wasn't. And so uh, Greg looks at Isaiah fourteen twelve, which is sort of this this popular. Uh, kind of, I don't know what you would call it, like a nod to Satan, where originally uh, Isaiah was talking about a king, but um, you could tell that Isaiah was using language in such a way that he was also pointing to something much bigger. And so this is this uh, this passage is where we get this idea of the rising star or the brightest of the gods, uh, the CEO of the cosmos. Uh, it's it's um, it's what. Um, in the Latin where we get the word Lucifer is from this, this bright luminescent star. And, uh, 
And so what happens here is that this character, this Lucifer character, is driven by this desire to ascend, to to rise to the throne, to uh, be like God. But of course, that is a lie. And this this uh, prideful ascent mindset is what Greg calls it, um, gets everyone who gets wrapped up into that into trouble, including uh, Satan or Lucifer. Um, and then uh, Greg just notes that in this way, uh, the 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 pride carries the seed of its own destruction in the same way that believing that you're a superboy when you're not, uh, you have this seed of your own destruction because when you try to fly, you're going to fall and hurt yourself. And, and so that's that's how the consequences of the sin are buried within the behavior itself, which I think is pretty profound. And then and then Greg just shows how the serpent who was sort of living in this alternative mindset, who was trying to ascend to God, who was discontent with himself, uh, that's that's the same pitch that he brings to uh, Eve in the garden. And and uh, and he says, look, <laughs> God told you that, that that's just one version. Here's the reality. And and he paints this alternative picture that God is really underhanded in trying to keep people down so that they don't rise up to his level. And so uh, the serpent sort of dupes humanity into striving upward and entering into that prideful ascent mindset. And it's that mindset that really epitomizes Babylon, which we will come back to in the book of Revelation when we start that series again next week. But, you know, the, the lies are, are, are robust. And, and Greg talked about how, you know, we believe that uh, we can define our reality for ourselves and that we deserve more than what we have and that it's okay for us to be self-centered and to exploit uh, others and to just use resources at, at will and um, to conquer and to waste whatever we have. We just believe that that's okay for us. And eventually... Uh, we're going to face the consequences. We're going to crash in the same way that um, Superboy crashed and Lucifer crashed. Uh, and yes, Bat Dan also crashed uh, in his own life. Um, and so that's sort of the foundation now that Greg takes all of that and and comes back to, okay, let's look at this politics series now. Uh, what's going on in Western culture? And he's, he thinks this... This culture in the West is very much like Babylon. There is this ascent sort of mindset, and um, and and no one is content, and 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 we're we're just we're, you know, burning through fossil fuels, and we're we're all about profits, and and it's just um, it's sort of it's rampant this uh ascent mindset and trying to get more 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 and so what he proposes is that what we find in the scripture is the antidote to this is a uh he calls it a loving descent mindset or another way to say that is humility and that's what we don't have in our culture is humility there's just no humility uh anywhere especially in politics and so what you find then uh, in the scripture is not only does the scripture call us to hum humility and God calls us to humility, but God, these aren't empty, you know, principles. These aren't like empty kind of uh, whatever they're called, uh, motivational posters that God actually put skin in the game here. God lives this out. God, uh, we're told in Philippians, empties himself to become human. He sets aside all of his own advantages so that he could become like us. Um, and so that's the mindset that we are called to have too, to, uh, to instead of trying to ascend higher, rather try to empower others who are even below us and to, to work from the bottom up and to lift others up and uh, to have that type of heart, that loving descent mindset. And that means that we have to strive to be content with who we are and what we have. And we have to reject the temptations of Babylon. And we have to put our hope not in technology, not in the government, not in the advances of science. Our hope has to be ultimately in this radical love that's demonstrated in God's own kenosis, it's called, that giving up of, of uh 
powers so that he could be with us at our level. And then Greg just finishes by noting that this does not mean that we're self-loathing. It, if we're rejecting this ascent mindset, that's, that doesn't mean that we are uh, uh, exalting um, self-loathing or anything like that. It's just rather being secure in your uh, self, in who you are in Christ. It's, it's being anchored in the truth of who you are, not uh, living as if in a way that you're not. And I think that that is an important thing. And so that identity in Christ becomes uh, very, very important. And um, like I said, it, it was a very dense message and he got it all in there in a way that didn't feel dense. But when you actually break it down, wow, he had a lot of stuff and a lot of things kind of um, circling back on itself in this message. And uh, I have to say, I, I think, um, and that I want to hear your thoughts on this too, but just as, as a note, just from taking notes, this is one of his more brilliant messages in terms of what he was able to accomplish in such a short amount of time. I thought it was uh, fantastic. So uh, what are your thoughts on, on the sermon? I know you had some audio issues and you kind of got to it. You didn't get to marinate in it as much as normal, yeah, but that I first did. impact, what did you think? Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah. First impact is a great way to put it. Um, <clears throat> we know I'm a reflector, but this is, this is some of my first thoughts were, I honestly feel like, and even as I was trying to like ferociously take notes, you know, as I was listening this morning, um, I, 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 it really felt like this could be three, four separate sermons, right? Because it was very dense. However, the way he tied it all together, it fit beautifully as one sermon. Mm -hmm. And then in many ways, it was like, okay, we're in political distortions, examining our heart postures, but we're looking at Lucifer and the great deception of pride and all of that. And, and, and my mind goes to, you know, because he talked about, you know, in the garden and the deception of Eve and Adam and, and, and how, you know, Lucifer, he does, he paints this picture of non-reality and he did the same thing to Jesus. Like we talked about that earlier in the series, you know, the temptations of Jesus, when he tried to say, Hey, look, this, like he tried to paint a different picture for him. And, and thankfully the Lord was not, you know, going to fall for that. He does it with humanity over and over again, just this whole pride thing. And so as I, as I'm thinking big picture and then zooming into heart postures, I just felt like that was done really well. And mm -hmm. so my brain is still kind of swirling and you know me, I will probably listen again and spend some more time reflecting. Um, but I just, I kept finding myself thinking like, goodness, how, how does this play out when you talk about uh, humility versus pride, a practical ascent mindset? Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a prideful ascent mindset, Pam, versus mm -hmm. a humility mindset. How does that play out in my daily life? How does it play out in regards to some of the um, political distortions that we've been talking about? How does that play out as I'm interacting with folks? And so um, th these are some of the, the the questions that I'm just initially asking and, and sorting mm -hmm. through, like, what does this look like? And then um, I had the thought of, gosh, so many times people, I think, um, misunderstand what we mean when we say, when we talk about being prideful and also misunderstand what we say when we talk about being humble, having humility. And so I love it that Greg referenced your book um, mm -hmm. because I think that's a really great resource and we could spend some time diving into that a little bit. So I appreciated that Greg kind of said, hey, this is not, it's not wrong to have pride in things, to be proud mm -hmm. of things, but it's about, you know, again, a heart posture, a mindset. And then humility isn't self-loathing. I think that's so important. I think people yeah. think, um, well, I don't know what people think, but I, I know that it's not good stuff when they think humility. They just think, you know, they're just going to be beat down and yeah. and um, a, a doormat for folks. And that's not what it is either. And so how it all plays together, I'm still processing and thinking yeah. through, but um yeah, I, I I thought it was really, honestly, a really brilliant way to conclude the mm -hmm. series, um, from big picture to 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 more boots on the ground. Um, yeah, so I, I'm yeah. kind of rambling now, but yeah, yeah, no, that's that's good. I think. Uh... Well, in the way he finished it too, looking at this posture, this mindset, 
as sort of like the grounding for everything else, I think, I think was great too. Like it's when you are secure in yourself and who yes. you are in Christ, in Christ that now you can let your gentleness show. But when you're striving to be more and more and more, well, now you have to weigh like, well, if, if I let gentleness show here, will that sabotage my goal of being up there? And that's exactly what we see. We see people who are like, you know, you, you have to teach them a lesson. You can't let gentleness show. You have to show that you have to teach them a lesson. And, mm -hmm. and so they, that, kind of like being one upping everybody and getting higher. It just, it, it doesn't allow you to do these teachings, like let your gentleness show or be patient with others. But when you are secure in who you are in Christ, now you can let your gentleness show. And now you can, cause you're secure. You're not, you're not threatened by those things. Yeah. And, uh, I, and well, I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. I'm glad you, you brought that back up because I thought that was a really lovely way to, to end the sermon was just talking about, and I think it like came to him in the moment. Cause he said, he's like, he was just seeing this, like we will, a lot of times these political distortions are, they can thrive so easily in our lives because our, our view of ourself is distorted. We're not aligned with, uh, how we are truly identified in Christ. And so when we are not aligned in that way, then yeah, we're going to identify ourselves and we're going to um, get our worth from all of these exterior things and ideals. And, um, you know, I, I just, I think that is so foundational. Mm -hmm. And again, I feel like a whole nother sermon that certainly could be preached, but it just all tied together really well and just showed again, the interconnectivity of it all and yeah. just how, how crucial this stuff is. So for those who are thinking, ah, this, this is a political series. What do you know? Like, yes, but also this is like, this is us. This is like yeah. our heart. This is who we are. This is like how we live as believers. And I just think it's mm -hmm. uber relevant. And I hope people continue to marinate in this stuff and, yeah. and strive to live it out. Yeah, I agree with that. And and also just that distinction between, okay, yeah, this is a politics series and we are in a politically tense time right now because of the election. But politics is really just the polis. You know, it's like, how do we manage civilization and how do we uh, interact fairly with each other? And those dynamics are around all the time. And so yeah. that's why some of these heart postures, yeah, they're, they might be more intensely important during a hostile time or a tense time like this, but they're always important. And, uh, and that's, so the, this, this series, I think can have that sort of, uh, continued return on investment mm -hmm. is, is what mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah, so. absolutely. You know, I, I, I do have some other things to say just about that relationship between humility and pride. and, and if, I, Yeah, if I would want, love to do there. that. I was going to ask you to kind of tap into that a bit because um, you did write a little book. <laughs> I did, yes. A little helpful right, yeah. resource. So yeah. um, I think that would be really helpful for folks. Should we so. do that now? Yeah, let's go. Okay. Well, I, I just, I'll just say that um, it's such a, a, a tricky thing because we've, We've been um, most of us have been raised in in this idea that pride is the antithesis of humility, and um, and 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 it makes sense to say that because uh, I can't conceive of a humble person who's also proud, like or arrogant. Pride is one thing; arrogance is kind of the bad thing that we want to avoid. And um, however, when you think about arrogance or or this type of pride, this toxic type of pride. Uh, the actual antithesis of that is is not humility. It is shame. It is self-loathing. And, uh, and so to say that humility is the antithesis of this arrogance or pride would be to say that it's equal to shame and self-loathing. But we, we don't see that in Jesus, but we do see that in a lot of churches. A lot of churches have this model of humility and they end up kind of pushing people down. And so uh, basically what what I argue is that in, in Matthew 23, especially Jesus provides this alternative view of humility. And I have this little drawing in my book, uh, there it is, where it kind of shows that that pride is the antith antithesis of shame and humility is contrary to both. And, and what that means is it's kind of like this. Uh, when you think of like pacifism and war, you could say that, you know, <laughs> 
you wouldn't say that pacifism is the opposite of winning a war. Uh, the opposite of winning a war is losing a war. Pacifism is against both. Pacifism is against war itself. And, um, and really, you know, humility is against whatever it is that creates both shame and pride. Um, and what that thing is, I talk about in my book, but it's basically living in some way other than your identity in Christ. It, it's, it's, it's thinking that you're something other than what the Bible says you are. And, uh, and that could be up or down and, and humility is contrary to both. And so humility largely is living in that security of who you are in Christ. It's, it's, it's realizing that fundamentally you are fundamentally loved by the creator of the universe. And, and so is everyone that you encounter. And, and so treating yourself and others in that way, that's, that's the, I think the the foundation of the humility that Jesus teaches in the New Testament, um, and so that is kind of just the, the the elevator pitch for for that view of humility, and it's a uh, it's a view that um, uh, is new to a lot of people it's still today. Like it, when I encounter people, even within Woodland Hills, it's it's still new to them, and um, so I hope people benefit from that and can can uh, think about that. That is really helpful, Dan. Um, let's, let's like get like really practical for folks. So how can the way that you have described and talked about humility in your book, how can we take that and implement it as a heart posture as we are kind of having some of these conversations that are contentious and we're, you know, we, we find ourselves in a world that is really polarized. Like how, how does this um, empower us to live more Christ-like and more true to our identity in Christ? Yeah. Well, I think um, he here's what I would say is that uh, there's, a, there's a, a lot. I mean, boy, I don't even know where to start. But I guess one thing I would say is when you when you think that um, when you think that if you don't live in this humble way where you you you're not fundamentally loved um well that means a lot of, for a lot of people especially in this sort of uh prideful ascent mindset the assumption of this prideful ascent, ascent mindset is that you are not secure you have to get you have to achieve you have to arrive at this higher spot you have to accomplish the aspiration that whatever it is, whether it's, you know, uh, money or fame or whatever it is that you're trying to aspire to, y your security hinges on that. And there's the, this, uh, there's this frantic discontentment inherent in that until you get that. And of course, what happens is even when you do get that, it's, it's, it's not fulfilling. And so the frantic discontentment returns. And, but when you live in this humility, when you live in the reality that fundamentally you are secure, whether you know it or not, uh, you are secure because God loves you with an unsurpassable love. And, um, and, and that at the very basic, uh, level helps because it, 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 it gets rid of that frantic discontentment and, and that gets rid of our, our fragility to, uh, people who argue with us, people who make claims about us, people who disagree with us. We're not vulnerable to any of that because we are living in the, the most profound security we can have. The creator of the universe, uh, became the antithesis of himself, became sin on the cross to demonstrate how much he loves me. And if I live in that profound, insurmountable, philosophically ex most extreme possible payment and demonstration of love, if I start there, well, no, I'm invulnerable to everything. There's nothing that can hurt me. There's nothing that is a threat to me. Not even death is a threat to me because the creator of the universe has promised that he will be with me. And, and so to live in that, I don't have to get worked up about all of the things that people say and the people who disagree and the shocking pictures. And did you hear what this person said? And look at what these people are, these people, look at what they're doing and, and they're going to ruin our country. And I just, 
I'm invulnerable to all of that. I can now just focus on what God calls me to do, which is to love those around me, which is to love the people that I come across. I don't have to solve the world's problems. I don't have to do any of that stuff. I just love the people I can love in this godly way because I live in that security and I'm not threatened by those things. And and to me, that is the 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 best kind of most comforting part of living like that. And then the second uh, part of that is to realize that if God has this unsurpassable love for me, that means that we as God's people are unsurpassably equal. Uh, because if he has unsurpassable love for me, that means that he can't have more love for anybody else. Otherwise, his love for me would have been surpassable. And so that 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 the fact is, is that we are all equally unsurpassably loved, which means that you know, I can go in and I can be wrong about stuff. And that doesn't demote me beneath the people who are right. It doesn't uh, derogate me beneath anybody. There, There's nothing that can threaten that uh, security that I have. And that just means that I can just be honest. I can just live uh, more truthfully. Um, Poon is the word that Greg you, uh, taps into from the Old Testament. And, and, and that means that I can treat people in a way that um, th I, I recognize their, their equality with me as being unsurpassably loved by God. Even if they're doing despicable things, I can challenge that that behavior. I can stand up to that behavior, but not in a way that is um, hostile or violent because they are precious children of God as well. And it just, for me at least, it takes a lot of that uh, competition out of everything, and it takes a lot of the feeling of threat out of everything, and it just allows me to be an ambassador of this profoundly loving God. Uh, you know, we're human, and we 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 screw up, but this mindset, more than anything else, has uh, helped me uh, a great deal. Um, so I guess that's my answer to that. I love it, Dan. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's a great reminder that, I mean, I, I don't know every single person listening to the show or tuning into Woodland, but um, I would say for most of us, we're not world leaders. Mm -hmm. We we aren't running um, world governments. And so there's a lot of things that we don't have answers or qualifications to try to solve or answer but what I am is a daughter of the king. What I am is a child of God. What I am is someone who is loved beautifully, perfectly, um, and I have unsurpassable worth. And so out of that identity is how I am to treat and behave um, with others. So there's a lot that I can't solve or do, but what I can do is be about what I'm supposed to be about. And that is loving others as Christ has loved me. That is being humble. That is, uh, you know, actively trying to say no to things that may well up within me that says more, more, you yeah. know, because I think um, it's a, it is a part of, of the nature of, of our culture is to want mm -hmm. more. And so um, it is to be forgiving and gentle. And um, while at the same time, you know, speaking truth in love and, and all, uh, yeah. So it's all of these heart postures that we've been talking about and the many more that we did not have years and years to get to. But, um, and I think that's the beauty of the series is recognizing these huge global issues, but we have a place amongst all of that and our place it's, it's been very clearly laid out for us our place, mm -hmm. who we are and what we do and how we behave. And so I'm really thankful for it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen to all of that. Amen to all of that. Are you ready to get back to Revelation, Dan? I am excited to get back to Revelation. And um, I feel a little rusty because we've spent a long time on this. So I, I'm uh, today I'll be dipping my mind back into the, the river. And hey. uh, so, hey. yeah. Yeah, we gotta, we get, yeah, because chapter six, just a little sneak peek, it's a coming and it's yeah. gonna be good and it is a doozy. So <laughs> we, we need to start getting in those waters. Um, Dan Kent, right. do you have any other thing, not nugget, 
Uh, do you have okay. any other thing? This is like the prelude to the nugget. Mm. This is a little appetizer before the nugget. Do you have anything about political distortions examining our heart postures that you'd like to say prior to uh, nugget time? You know, um, boy, I, that's a good question. I, I really like how Greg wrapped it up, uh, yeah. just showing how humility in this kind of uh, power under mindset um, really does ground all of the other heart postures in yeah. this way. And I think that's why the scripture does have this emphasis on it. Um, and, and I'll just say that, um, you know, I think that the the humility that Jesus teaches is contrary to both pride and shame. Um, but pride is definitely talked about a lot more than shame. Uh, you know, you do see Jesus uh, combating shame, like when the woman at the well and, yeah. and stuff like that, you know, but it's definitely, uh, pride is the thing that he goes after more than, him. And, and the scripture itself goes after more than anything. And I think a lot of that has to do with, for the most part, arrogance is a threat to the community more than self-loathing is. Self-loathing mm -hmm. is just a tragic threat to the self. Yeah. And so in terms of its, uh, uh, kind of damage, potential for damage, I think that arrogance has a broader uh, mm -hmm. amount of damage that can do. I would say the damage is the same, but it's just that self-loathing, the damage is focused on the self and yeah. and it can be, boy, it can just be so terrible. Uh, and it's a, it's a gravity that shame and self-loathing, it's just this profound gravity that's hard to get out of that orbit. Um, but I've seen people do it and I've seen people get out of that orbit and to start to see themselves as God sees them. Um, and, and, but not to be self-inflated, not to think, you know, you're something that you're not, but rather just to see what you actually are. Mm -hmm. uh, but the self-loathing is, is tough to get out of. Yeah. So that's what I would say. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that really answers your question, but that just yeah. came to me as we're talking. No, I like it. I like it. It's just a, it's just like a little bonus bow for folks yeah, that's right. as yes, we are yes, closing yeah. out political distortion yeah. for those premium subscribers. That's what you <laughs> that's get right. there. Yes. All right, folks, yes. thank you really, really from the bottom of our hearts for for being with us throughout political distortions. I, I feel like I always am saying thank you for your engagement, but truly like this mm -hmm. is a series that you that many of you could have opted out and thank you for not doing that. You guys, you know, you participated in a variety of ways. You the feedback has been great. Uh, the dialogue has been wonderful. And just the the challenge that I feel like that we've all been feeling and hearing, I, I think has really been heartfelt and really um, has been taken seriously. And I'm really encouraged by that. And mm -hmm. it makes me feel, I'm going to say, a bit prideful in the fact that with all of the eh happening in the world, that we have like this, this body of people who are like, not today. This we're not gonna play into that. This is how we're going to present, um, and how we're going to be, and how we're going to love, and how we're going to combat all the nastiness. And so, mm -hmm. it makes us. It makes you feel like you're a part of a team that's really like you know fighting the good fight. And I I appreciate it. So thank you, thank you all. And with that, we go into nugget time. <laughs> There we go. Dan, do you want nugget open or nugget close? Um, I could go either way. Okay. How about, I feel like I could go either way too. All right, I'll go first. <laughs> it's decisiveness. Yeah. That's what it is. Well, I'll just say that... Um, you know, part of part of what, and actually, is the subtitle of of the book too. I have uh, becoming your full self without becoming full of yourself, and oh, wow. uh, and I I think that's what God's call for humility is, uh, because your full self is the way the Bible says that you are. You're God's beloved child, and all of that, um, and and yet. Uh, so often people feel like anything positive threatens their humility uh, because they have this idea that humility is the opposite of of pride. And so anything positive moves you toward pride. And, and I don't think that that's the case because 
pride or arrogance is to be superior to others. But we know that that's not true. We know that we are unsurpassably equal, uh, which means that you can uh, strive to be effective at stuff. You can be uh, gifted. You can let your gifts flourish. You can uh, accomplish things without threatening your humility because humility is this unsurpassable love of God and this unsurpassable equality. And I think that that's important because, you know, you think of like Jesus and the apostle Paul. And in, in fact, Paul one time even said, I think it was to the, uh, uh, the Corinthians. He said, I wrote to you with great humility. <laughs> He's even boasting about his humility. And, uh, and so you, you can't do that if humility is this low kind of bad thing. And, uh, and I think the reason why that's so important is because uh, definitely arrogance is, is such a threat to unity and to community. Uh, but so is kind of this false humility, this false self-loathing. And because the fact is, is that, you know, Paul and Peter and Jesus, they drew crowds to them. They're, they had uh, charisma. They had something that other people wanted. And nobody wants self-loathing. That's not going to draw people, you know, to God. Uh, I think, you know, being able to live, uh, you know, in love and to have good relationships and to be effective in the world without feeling like you're better than others, that's what draws people, I think, uh, to God. That's what being an ambassador of Christ is. If you are representing God in the world and you think yourself terrible and miserable and da 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 da, -da you're turning people off. I mean, that's where is God's power in your life? What what difference has God made that's positive? It seems like God has only made negative differences in your life. And so that's why I think, you know, realizing that humility is contrary to arrogance and self-loathing, it really opens up the possibility of being a magnet for God's king, uh, kingdom, being a light shining on a hill. I mean, you know, the self-loathing, that's not a light shining on a hill. That's, that's a black hole. That's, you know, that's, that's a darkness. If darkness could shine, that's what that self-loathing would do. And uh, that's why I think Jesus' teaching is so radical and, and so helpful. Uh, and, and it helps us be light instead of just more darkness. And I guess that would be my nugget. Good nugget, Dan. Um, as I have been in the short time that I've had reflecting on the sermon, um, one of the passages that Greg shared um, has been ruminate, you know, just, you know, in my brain. And it's the Philippians passage. It's something that it is one of my favorites, but the one about, uh, you know, doing nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility, um, consider others and do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. And, and when Greg shared that, he was kind of talking about the contrast of humility versus pride. And um, as I try to reflect and think um, and pray about how I can live this out, the, the question that just keeps coming to mind is, is, is how can I love well? In any given situation, how can I love well? How can I love others well? How can I love myself well? How can I love, show my love for God well? How can I love my community well, my church well, um, my neighbor well? Like, I feel like if I, if I can be asking that question, then that puts me in the proper posture to, um, to be living in more of a humility mindset versus a pride mindset. And again, I'm not trying to say that to be boastful or like, Ooh, but, but I feel like we have to, we have to do things in our life that trigger the behaviors that we are hoping to walk in, um, and that we're hoping, you know, to show others. And so a lot of these things don't come up naturally for us because we are so bombarded by the opposite. And I think our natural inclination many times can be, you know, to fight fire with fire. And so for me anyway, to, to, to sort of try, kind of trigger a different mindset, I think a good question is, is how can I love well? And many times 
most times that's going to look different depending on the situation, depending on who you're interacting with, you know, um, sometimes it is speaking the truth and love. Sometimes it is, you know, silently just listening to a different perspective. Sometimes it is seeking to understand something instead of trying to explain your, your view or your perspective. So it, it can look a, a many, many different ways. That is just barely even the tip of the iceberg, the examples that I just shared, but I do feel like it is a good, for me anyway, a good way to at least put myself in that posture of um, humility versus pride. How can I love well in this situation? So maybe yeah. that'll be helpful to someone because that's yeah. my nugget. All right. That's good. Yeah. Well, that's a good nugget to wrap up the series too, because that awesome. is ultimately what it is. It's like, how do I love? Well, yeah. so that's our call. Uh, that's our call. I love it. Yep. All right. You guys continue to uh, tune in and let's chat about it. 4 PM on YouTube. We'll see you there. If you have questions, comments, uh, anything, uh, send them to where Dan right here, right here. newscast as at whchurch.org. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful week. And hey, Revelation coming right back at you. Don't miss it. Take care. See ya.